eight. I'm uh, going to put 7.3. Your presentation will be going, but we will have an executive session after that. Um, so, uh, approval of the uh, amended agenda. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay, the motion has been made by Ms. Long and seconded by Ms. Power. Right, discussion on the motion. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. nay. I spirit to have it. I do have declared motion approved. Recognition staff. Uh, first will be uh, staff recognition. Sorry. Yes, today I want to read what was read at the state level. Uh, Mrs. Mejias is our financial secretary at North Middle School in Berkeley County, West Virginia. In her 15 years of service, Mrs. Mejias has embodied what it means to be adaptive and resilient. In the past seven years, she has trained multiple enrollment secretaries, planned coverage schedule for teachers, and received a perfect audit each year. According to her colleagues, Mrs. Mejias consistently finds ways to recognize the staff and students and is always willing to be a mentor to a student in need. In addition to her secretarial obligations, Mrs. Mejias volunteers at local CIS events helps organize Martinsburg North's closet and assist the girls basketball team. Uh, I just wanted to point out that she was rec recognized as service personnel for the month for Berkeley County. She made it to the state level um, among the top 10 finalists, and now she is being recognized for service personnel. <laughs> Let's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Murphy would like to say a couple words. Oh, absolutely. Oh, come on up here. Come on up here. <laughs> I, I spelled your name phonetically. My oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's quite an honor, and you've been uh, selected for this. Uh, we don't we don't distinguish between service and professional when we do this, because we feel like all of us are pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. I used to work on a carnival when I was a kid. On the weekends, got paid under the table. Don't tell me. Mm -hmm. that. <laughs> but everybody at sunrise had to go out and grab a rope and pull the uh, the hub for the, the merry-go-round. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see here. I mean, the owner of the car uh, carnival is out there. We all were out there grabbing that rope, pulling in the same direction. And that's the type of representation you are giving here showing that you're pulling on that road for your school, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We want to get a picture of the board with you, okay? All right. More down, and the superintendent, which is which. Hold the word so you can see it. <laughs> All right, ready? Go. One, two, three. Perfect. I wish I could picture with your family as well. Yeah. All the families coming up, I just wanted to take a moment to say that um, Ari has been very welcoming uh, at the office of the North Middle School. 
uh, any visit that I've made. And it did not surprise me a bit that her family didn't want to decline any pictures because she tried to decline a picture with me earlier this summer. <laughs> so I had to do all of this.
things that they need to have on this trip. Uh, and, uh, when they go to these colleges, so I can answer the question. Actually, I just said them. <laughs> um, what Mr. Murphy's talking about is um, the Alpha Street Baptist Church. Um, they have uh, the biggest uh, HBCU college fair in the nation every year, and they move their dates. But now it's actually in October, so it's like right around the corner. Yeah. Well, the problem we run into is. They open up the registration is open now, so they open up registration and they told them sure not now. So they have a quick turnaround. So the information there is going to be virtual and in person. So students this year can actually do a virtual one. Um, they do um, get a band scholarship. You can you know uh, get into school, but all the information I'm giving to them, and then we'll get to guidance counselors. So uh, if students do want to go. Uh, Person somehow, so they try to figure out how to get them there. Uh, but it's a one of our kids, we 80 some colleges plus some uh, military federal agency will be there just to let the students know what's going on in there. And so, to any students, not simply minority students, but because it's easy to open everyone. Uh, but if students are really interested in going to those type of schools, then they can take that opportunity. Yeah, well, I just wanted to make sure that you all. That was one of our conversations today, actually. Okay, uh, you talked about after school programs. Uh, one of the problems like students have uh, who attend boarding school, they can't stay after school because they don't have transportation after school to go on. And so they're missing out on the second school enrichment activity. I just wanted to point that out. Inner city kids can walk home at the uh, edges of and some of those areas unless they live in one of the subdivisions and that helps. I know uh, we have over 40 different languages in Berkeley County. I know these like that, I guess it's Religious life of the year. But anyway, that, that's a you were talking about like language and tutorial programs. Is, is that a language that parents can go who are not bilingual? So well, um, what I mentioned was virtual tutoring um, for students in the rigorous courses. I don't know. Did you mention Raymer? Um, well, what I was mentioning that's at Raymer is Perk. And when I think about PERC, uh, one of the services that come to mind is, um, you know, sometimes IEP meetings are very uh, overwhelming for parents who don't understand the language. And so we have PERC representatives who will sit with a parent as an advocate through an IEP meeting to help provide comfort and support. Um, that's just one example of what PERC offers. Uh, so that is located at the Raymer Center. Um, as far as our language program or our translation program, um, so for example, if we have a parent teacher conference night or if we have, uh, if we need a translator, uh, we have a program now through, I believe, federal programs that will allow us to dial a phone extension with that specific language and be able to translate to that parent in real time. And then DefNet is a service that we offer for parents um, who uh, cannot are deaf during meetings like um, parent teacher face to face conferences. And uh, finally, uh, uh, a scholarship application process. A lot of the children whose parents would be the first people in the world need help. The full February process begins to help them get in there because they don't have, I don't know if the parents understand the process, but there's a lot of help with a lot of our students are paying for it. They are going on, or even going into trade schools, these primary students. You need the prep kids before the, before the February application process. I know Mr. Stevens could probably talk about this. But a lot of potential 
Sometimes I might be hearing about this Title IX issue. Thank you. Ready? Well, I have one question. Okay. One question. Um, he mentioned that there were students with over 40 different languages. Do we know if we have staff that has the ability, enough staff in our school system to assist with the language? Barrier? Resources that she mentioned, um, there's, there's a list of, yeah. of uh, resources that we utilize. We don't have anyone that can speak 40 languages. So, well, no, but, but I, I would but love resources. <laughs> I, I don't know if we have the resources that were, were listed. Um, we have everything from in person translators to the, to the, to the phone translators to um, a variety of uh, resources that are used in those situations. And it, it, it varies, it depends on if we're talking about a meeting where, uh, you know, like she said, it's, it is academic to IP. Uh, if it's if the parent comes in and initiates and has questions, if the parents at home, and wants to call in, uh, speak to the counselor. There's there's a variety of different uh, different levels to each of those resources as well. How do we help the students though that are might be in the classroom that only speak, for instance, Spanish? That's all they speak. Do we have enough people that can help them understand and translate while they're also? No, we never have enough. <laughs> there's never enough. I mean, the answer is we never. Have enough. But the, the, the truth is, we do have people that are serving in all those roles. Okay. Um, we we have translators. Uh, we mentioned Spanish. We have Just throwing that out there. Yeah. That is that is a common. Yes. You know, but um, you know, I recently dealt with a family that was French Creole, and okay, you know, there's a there's a there's a totally different challenge when you have something that is. Not taught in the school system by our English language, um, our English learners, I should say, uh, program through federal programs is, um, you know, they provide services to the family, to the students, and to the, to the parents. My concern is I don't want that student who might not understand what's going on in the classroom to fall behind, and I don't want them to feel left out. They're, they're paired. Okay. With uh, uh, person at each of the schools that uh, is responsible for the English language. Okay. Learners of the English language. ELL, ETL. Great. Yeah. Well, I also, sorry, I don't mean to continue this, but I wanted to mention that principals were given a presentation on um, how to use PowerPoint and closed captioning. So as the teacher speaks and gives the lesson, the PowerPoint presentation translates that in their native language so that they can follow along with the lesson. And if the teacher doesn't have that? It's in PowerPoint. We all have access to Word and Microsoft products. Okay. We'll talk later. Okay. And, and this is a first. Yeah. I mean, we've always had Thank you. 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 Good evening. So tonight I want to do an update on where we are with the bond call as of today, which we are about 50 days out from the election. <clears throat> So for just to get the message out to everyone who uh, both attends and, and watches these meetings at home, I want to share this information as well as review it with board members and see if there's any new questions that have come up along the way. So I'll quickly review some of the factors that led up to the 2022 bond call, and we'll go over the projects that are listed in 
the actual election order and we'll have a chance to go over any questions that you might have and I'll share some of the events that are coming up. So two major factors have pushed us towards this bond election in November. <clears throat> One, of course, is growth in Berkeley County and in Berkeley County schools. And the other one is the condition of our current facilities in the county. So the growth is evident, it's everywhere. Uh, this year alone, we had 2,000 new home sites that received final cloud approval. There's a list here of just a few developments in the area, you know, 800 homes coming east of Martinsburg, 200 homes right in Hedgesville and Dillon Farms, 700 plus, right down the street from their Spring Mills campus at Cardinal Point. About 500 new apartments and townhomes in the city of Martinsburg, which is fairly new on our radar, uh, dating back to when our enrollment projections and study were done, those were not, not on the forecast, as well as over a thousand new homes in the southern part of the county. Along with these new homes is lots of commercial and industrial growth which is a good thing, it's providing many new jobs in our area. But what we've learned is the very best predictor of new enrollment in our schools is actually the new jobs. For every 3.5 new jobs created in the county, we're guaranteed at least one student will enroll in our district. So when we had our enrollment <clears throat> projections and studies done, what we learned is we can expect up to 4,000 new students by the year 2031. These numbers seem very accurate so far. In fact, we may be trending just above this number. If we look at where we are today. As of last week, we had over 20,000 kids enrolled in Berkeley County Schools. That's an unofficial number, but like I said, that was as of last week. We've got over 1,200 pre-K students and those students are in 67 classrooms in all of our, almost all of our 32 school sites. There's 32 schools, are not getting any younger. The average age is 54 years old, and there's eight schools that will turn 100 years old by 2030. I don't have to explain to anybody that nothing lasts forever. Roofs wear out. Bricks and mortar deteriorate, HVAC systems, plumbing and electrical, everything has a serviceable life. And many of our buildings are approaching uh, or well beyond that service life. So we came together to, to form a long-term plan for the future. We know it's important to continue to monitor enrollment. We need a plan to continue to evaluate and care for our current facilities. We can't turn them over. We have, many of these facilities will continue to be used for many years, despite the fact that they're approaching or at 100 years old. And we have to figure a way to increase the number of seats in the classrooms with 4,000 new students on the way. So as we looked at this growth and the hot spots of that growth, according to the enrollment projections, we're able to determine that in the next period of time, we're going to actually need eight new educational facilities a number of remodels and additions to make room for that growth. In addition to just the new buildings, as I said, we've got many other buildings we have to maintain and improve to bring up the current standards. <clears throat> There's many projects in our CEFD, some have been recently updated, others have been in there since 2020, that are focused around student safety, health and environmental conditions, as well as program improvements. So with uh, hours of work from this board, which I definitely appreciate, and everyone else that was involved, we were able to look at what was a reasonable number of projects to bring to the public in November, and what are the most crucial projects to get done first. So what you see on this slide are the actual projects that are in the election order. It includes two new elementary schools, two pre-K centers, two remodels in addition, and an auditorium renovation, as well as about $34 million in repairs and improvements to nearly every school in the county. All in all, there's 102 products, projects, sorry. And again, they focus on the things we've mentioned, creating new seats, building safer environments, improving environmental conditions and uh, program improvements. In addition, to the possible funds that could be gained to the grant, I'm sorry, to the bond. 
We have an opportunity for school building authority grants to give us even more funding opportunities. The after many conversations with the school building authority, they helped steer us towards the two most appropriate projects for SBA grants, and those were each of the new elementary schools. This is a rendering of, of uh, approximately what one of the new schools will look like. It's based on our current primary school in Spring Mills, just some minor changes. And the plan is to reuse that footprint with just some minor changes and updates in both the Fallen Waters area and the Jarrettstown area. The SBA felt like those were excellent candidates for needs grants and approved us to use SBA as a potential source of funding on our bond election order. So we're essentially able to, to tell the community of Berkeley County that upon passage of this bond, we stand an excellent chance of receiving up to $25 million in grants to help fund those two projects. So as this project has uh, been refined over the past year, we've presented it to various groups in Berkeley County Schools, as well as the, the greater community. And this is a list of some of the frequently asked questions. Hopefully you all might add to this list tonight, but I'll go over some of these quickly. One comment that came from everybody is I had no idea our schools were so old. Of course, it depends where you live and where your kids go to school. If you're in the Spring Mills area, you can get the idea that our schools are brand new and the most beautiful schools in the state. And if you're in some other areas, you have, you're very familiar with wood floors and historic buildings. And both are good, but there's a wide range in buildings. Why doesn't the state slash developer slash federal government slash contractor slash you fill in the next ones? Why don't they pay for the new schools rather than us going to the taxpayers? It's a common question. And I think it's it's not understood by many that school bonds are the primary way that new schools are constructed. The West Virginia School Building Authority is allocated money from the state each year. However, it's a fairly limited amount of money that is spread across 55 counties and everyone is in need just like we are. So although we are very fortunate to have some projects that are good candidates for SBA grants, of money through bonds is the primary way that new schools are built. Will bonds give teachers a raise? Unfortunately, it won't. A bond is for building. Bond funds are strictly for improvements to school facilities and building new facilities. So as you get that question asked to you by other people in the public, that's the correct answer. Do we have land for these new schools? Yes, we do. Um, we had board action some time ago to approve the purchase of the land in Jarrettstown for the schools that will be in that area. And we currently are have land uh, under transaction, I should say, uh, in, in the north end of the county. So we're hoping to, to move forward on that one sooner. What are the projects in my area? Well, there's 102 total projects. Our communications department has done an excellent job of putting all of this information on the Berkeley County Schools website. So anyone in, interested can go to the Berkeley County Schools homepage, go to our district, and then under our district, you'll see bond. It has all this information and more on, on that page. How can I help? This is a, a wonderful question to hear. And we've been asked by many, many different groups in the community. There is a, a community bond committee that has been formed. The chair, uh, I was hoping maybe here tonight, but she wasn't able to make it, is Sandy Hamilton. And I'd be happy to put anyone in, in contact with Sandy if they're interested uh, in becoming active in that community group. As a school employee, I'm limited, Mr. Stevens is limited, into just providing information. So we plan to do a lot of that in the upcoming months but I wouldn't try to sway anybody's vote one way or another. I would encourage everybody to vote and I would gladly share all the information that I can about, about this bond. However, the, the community committee and under those type of restrictions, and I'll mention that our board members are, are not under those, those type of restrictions either. So hopefully other people in the community will go out and um, share their thoughts on the bond as we provide information. And finally, the big one is how much will this cost me? 
That information is also, there's a good table on the website. I put together a couple slides tonight. And the first one I wanted to share, I really, I really enjoy because it shows the potential value in this bond if it were to pass. These are the, uh, the six most recently passed bonds. And then our potential bond is right in the middle. It's in the middle because that's where the cost of this bond to taxpayers ranks. <clears throat> so what that means is per $100,000 of home value, an, uh, I would pay with my owner occupied real estate, $7.25 per month per $100,000 of value. What I would get in return for that is nearly $125 million worth of school building projects. If you can compare that to what happens in some other counties, and that's all due to our, our tax, our real estate valuation, because we have such valuable property in Berkeley County, and there's more people to spread this out, this is how it affects us. If you compare that to Rome County, they're paying slightly more per month for less than $10 million in school building projects. It's quite a difference, I think, and I, I think it's a, a good point that everybody should be made aware of. Sister, I apologize. Sure. Um, right down there for the class two owner occupied column is that for Berkeley County, does that include the new homes that are being constructed and built currently? This is this is for any home that, that you live in, about a rental that you own or, or a for profit business. It's your home that you live in. I'm just trying to figure out if we're going to be, I guess, my where my brain is going is if I know that there's 10 townhomes coming in. Will it lower as they get certification and occupancies? Correct. Or? Correct. So when when this is when this amount is calculated in July, I believe it will be, uh, it's on the current homes that are there. Gotcha. Every day there's more homes being added, and as that happens, that amount okay. is divided by more. So potentially and historically, your payment would go down each year as the area continues to grow. Gotcha. Whereas some of those counties. It will go up. Yes. Yes. But just one more way to illustrate the cost is if you base this on your home that you live in, that's a price of two hundred thousand dollars. You could expect to pay fourteen dollars and fifty cents per month to fund the bond. And there's the discount if you're on the okay. if you have a homestead exemption. Um, Mr. Brady, that fourteen fifty. That's the maximum. I think for one of the other. Presentation that you're saying that that would be the maximum. Correct. This is this that. is this is based on a five point seven five percent interest rate, and by law, that's how we have to present this. With what was the foreseen maximum that this would go for? Uh, right now, I believe municipal bonds are going for more like three and a half percent. But to be safe and to be as clear as we can possibly be with voters, our financial advisor plugs in the highest number that he feels like this could possibly go for. Also, to be clear, because of our high valuation, you're, you're talking about a very big number. So a percentage change will not change that number of leaps and bounds, but it will change it. It will lower it. Are there any questions? Questions from members of the board. The present, we have one bond that's going to be retired. When's the present going to be retired? In 2025. It was 2010. It was 2010. 2010 was the original. It was refunded in 2020, and it ends, uh, the last payment would be May of 2025. And this is the best part of the point. These bonds that have been issued in the past and the interest rates that are low, they paid us refinancing and saved a little amount of money. Would you like to have anything to do that? No, you're, you're correct. When, when we have the opportunity, and typically it's the last five years of a bond, uh, is when you have the opportunity to, to refund them. And when we did that the last time, it allowed us to do the addition to Orchard View and the meetings and provided additional funds uh, from that refinancing. Questions by members of the board. Question: I think Danny and I were we were just kind of whispering to each other. I thought we were not able as board members to state whether to vote or not to vote for the bond. We were supposed to simply just present facts. I just want to make sure 
be clear because I don't want to say something that I shouldn't say. Um, because I know I, I know that some people can and some people can't. So I guess clarification on that just to make sure that we are you're an elected official. So it's my understanding that you can speak your mind to your consistent constituents about that. Uh, you can certainly clear that up with Ms. Coral. It is 100 percent short. The most recent conversation with her is that as long as you don't start the conversation by saying, as for the county school board member, I recommend that you, gotcha. if you're having a conversation with your constituents, you most certainly can say that. If you're not, as long as you're not acting in a constituent capacity, you will go uh, over there, you were talking about the uh, pre-K ice cream and uh, I had called up asking I, I had 44 doing the high school, five school, six in the intermediate, 31 in uh, pre-K through school. And I was just wondering how, how many did you say you had? 67 was the latest number I was given. These aren't private some some of them may be there there's still there's still our pre-k our pre-k classrooms we do have them in outside facilities yes and and we will continue to have them. Now. Absolutely. We're going to need to continue that. Yes. Okay. The other thing I love is that you actually have to have more room for a pre K classroom than, a, say, a first three books. Do I comment on that? I have seven oh, square feet. Ms. Michelle Martin's really the expert on the pre K guidelines, but it, it's true and it makes sense. For younger students, you need more, you need more room for them to move around. Yeah, and where when we free these classrooms up and all these schools will be able to, I mean, we set up class limitation of K to six, but uh, we'll be able to we'll have larger areas freed up. Really. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's an important part about the pre K centers for everybody to understand is not only is it making room for growth in the pre K ages. But it's freeing up much needed classroom space in many, many schools at, of, of all different ages. Um, and my question. Anyone else have a question? Thank you, sir. I did. I did. Uh, I found out that that's not. Next the next one is the the building gets there. So that's no problem. We don't build this. We still have five people for the next one. There are nine here for the next one. All right. Um, and the next West Virginia Southern River Settlement, and I'll catch the other one. We have great folders here. Mr. Murphy, since you mentioned it, let's just do a, a walkthrough very quickly so you'll know what's, what you have in your folder um, as, we, as we move through the presentation. Uh, the first item in your folder is a revised presentation um, PowerPoint from um, what you received in your packet on Friday. Uh, and it, it actually has the numbers on it and some minor changes. Um, moving through the packet, you'll see a, a colorful bar graph that shows the trend data from 2018, 2019, 2021, 2022 for mathematics and for English language arts. So you have that in terms of proficiency. Um, moving and going a little deeper, um, behind that, you'll see a, a chart or several charts. The charts reflect then the um, demographic data. So you'll see, we report out demographic data by three groups, by race, by status, and by gender. 
and you will see that there is a chart for English language arts, a chart for mathematics, uh, for the race group. Um, you'll see English language arts and mathematics for the status group. And you will see then uh, English language arts and mathematics for the gender group. When you look at this, um, what is highlighted, if you look across, that is um, the comparison of then the, um, the demographics by year. If you look um, down the chart, you'll look at the same uh, demographic um, over time. Anything that mm -hmm. is highlighted in yellow has been an increase from 21 to 22. So when you're looking at that, so that's what that, in, that indicates. Um, the last um, piece of information that you have in your packet, um, Mr. Murphy typically likes for the board to have access to the performance by school. So you will see in the last uh, staple packet then a performance by school compared to the district and the state. So those are the documents that you have in front of you this evening. We're going to, uh, because it's a board of you in the, at least I'll speak for you. So board of I have a chance to bring around the town here. We'll have a work session on this uh, later point. First, we'll give you all a chance to digest it, come the questions, and then we'll Tonight is just an overview for to, for you to see the big picture. So um, anyway, we'll go ahead and, and get started. And as I said, I'm, I'm working from the PowerPoint in your packet. Do you want me to go through? <laughs> That was the question. You never just see Mr. Murphy. <laughs> All right. This evening, our, our agenda is to provide an overview of the West Virginia Majors of Academic Progress, which is Policy 2340, uh, to review the 2022 Summit of Assessment data, and to articulate next steps to increase student achievement through a continuous school improvement model. As with everything that we do, it relates back to our strategic plan and our mission, vision, and core beliefs which our vision is to provide limitless opportunities and our mission is to provide multiple pathways to success for our students. And they are all driven underneath our, our core beliefs. And our goal is to have our students life ready. Um, the West Virginia Majors of Academic Progress, Policy 2340 is our framework in terms of what is our guidance for anything regarding assessment. So uh, this is what drives everything that we do in the state uh, according to statewide assessment in West Virginia. Next slide, please. As I said tonight, it's just a brief overview. And as we're looking at this, if you look at um, on the left-hand side, you will see sort of uh, what I refer to as sort of the onion. And we're focusing on the district level tonight and we're looking at proficiency. And so, but as we work through our data and as we analyze our data, we start at the district level, we drill down to the school level, to the grade level or department level, to the classrooms, down to the student level. If you go, uh, Sharon, can you go back? Over to the right side, in terms of our, our monitoring progress and our performance, everything is driven um, with our summit of assessment, which is the West Virginia General Summit of Assessment. And we have several measures that we look at in terms of monitoring progress and performance. We look at attendance, we look at behavior, we look at the graduation rate, on track to graduate post-secondary, English learners, ach academic achievement, and academic progress. So these are the measures that are driven by the West Virginia General Summit of Assessment or derived from the West Virginia General Summit of Assessment. Next slide, please. This is um, a chart that shows um, our, our grade levels and our enrollment for those grade levels, and then the number of test takers we had in ELA in the spring of 2022, the number of math test takers, and then we test grades uh, five and eight with science. So 
those are the two grades that are tested, and those are tested more in a grade level grant. So at grades three through five, that sign, when they take that science test, it is a compilation of what they have been taught from third to fifth grade. And then at eighth grade, it's a compilation of what they've been instructed from sixth through eighth grade with that. So it's tested in a, in a band format. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of uh, one of our indicators with our accountability system, we must test 95% of our students. And you can see that uh, this past year in reading language arts, uh, we tested 98% um, of our students, in math, 98%, and in science, 97%. We were equal to the state in terms of our participation rate. When we are looking at the data this evening, we are going to really focus on the English language arts and math because that is what it, the data is pulled from to create our balanced scorecard and our accountability data. Um, just to kind of give you an understanding of where we begin um, with the data, it's a combined student performance across all state summit of assessments. The first three that are bolded is what the data that we will be looking at tonight, it's where the data has pulled, been pulled from, the West Virginia General Summit of Assessment in grades three through eight, the SAT school day for grade 11, and then the West Virginia Alternate Summit of Assessment for grades three through eight and 11. The English language proficiency assessment, also known as Alpha 21, it is not in the data that we're looking at tonight, but it is a part of the balanced scorecard. Also to keep in mind when you're looking at this data tonight, the data is what we call full academic year data. Um, and so when we look at full academic year, that we're meeting the students that were enrolled greater than or equal to 135 days during the school year. All right, now as we move forward, it was just ironic that this Saturday, this past Saturday on the ABC Morning News, um, they had a report about um, nationwide and test scores. And they indicated that uh, the test scores that we are looking at nationally are the lowest test scores in de decades, and that they have fallen uh, dramatically in the past two years. And they gave some tips in terms of, okay, what can parents do? And it's what our teachers know, and it's what we know. We need to know where they are and where they need to be and how we're going to get them there. So the first slide, the first section of the PowerPoint, we're going to be looking at the English language arts portion in terms of proficiency. And this first slide, it shows the comparison um, of the district to the state. The state is in blue and the district is in blue. And you can see as, as the district, we are slightly below the state. However, at the eleventh grade, we are equal to the state in terms of our English language arts performance. Um, the one thing, though, to point out and to keep in mind, as you can see, overall, as a state, we are struggling. Next slide, please. Um, the next slides are now looking at our demographic data. Um, and the first slide shows our English language arts um, proficiency rate by race. And you can look at the different populations in terms of their performance. Uh, then we have our English language arts proficiency rate by status. And then we have our English language arts uh, proficiency rate by gender. One thing to keep in mind when we are looking at our demographic data, in order for a school to have a cell, <clears throat> to have a certain population, they must have 20 students. So not all schools will have the all. Um, demographic groups that um, I'm showing tonight from the district perspective. Um, now, this final slide in terms of our uh, English language arts section is a comparison from 21 to 22. And we do have some small celebrations. As you can see, we've made some progress um, in terms mm -hmm. of our English language arts from um, we have some slight progress across the board. Uh, now, um, I will tell you this, I thought that I had corrected this slide, uh, this uh, seventh uh, grade that is incorrect, that should be 37 and 37, that was, in, that was a typo on my part. All right, um, so as we move forward with the next section, it's the mathematics and it is set up exactly like the, the English language arts portion. So we were starting with a comparison from the, uh, to the state and the district comparison. 
Um, as you can see, once again, uh, the state is below 50%. However, we are slightly below the state across the board. Uh, the next section, we'll, we will look at then the demographic groups by race. Data and gender. Uh, once again, to end up the section for the mathematics, uh, you can see across the board that once again, we are seeing growth. Um, and so there, there, there is progress being made. Next slide, please. Um, this is our um, science data. And once again, the science is not part of the state accountability system. Um, but this is uh, information that, that you have available to you. So in terms of looking at how our students are performing in regards to our science. And sure, we can just go through the next fairly quickly. All right, and then we have our comparison uh, from 21 to 22 for science. Um, this is our picture in terms of the way when we look at SAP school day data, it is included into in the proficiency that the uh, reports that I, I we just briefly went through. Um, but this is also then the picture in terms of the way that the college board presents the data. And so you can see in terms of uh, where the district is at to the state and uh, to the US and internationally. The one thing to keep in mind when for us with um, the state and the district, we use the SAT as our summative assessment. There are only eight states in the United States that actually use SAT school day as their summative assessment. So when you think in terms of looking at then the US and the international um, numbers in terms of, of what their mean total is compared to the state and to the district, please keep in mind, these are students that choose to take the SAT school day. Um, and it's not something that, you know, is looked at as overall, they're not every one of our students, because all of our full academic year students you know, you know, the data is reported for us by full academic year. However, all of our students at grade 11 take the SAT school day. So that is a difference to keep them on. Um, so next steps in terms of looking at the, now that we've looked at the data and looking at our next step. Um, and the, um, the uh, reflective questions. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be out and working with uh, several different teacher groups. Um, since the beginning of school. And when you're looking at data, it's not so much the data that gives you the answers. It's the questions that you have about the data. So when we when we look with our with our teacher groups and we've been working with them, some of the questions we've asked, why does the data look the way it does? And we've asked them to give us a one word answer. And you know some of the answers came uh, from you know the standards. How well do our teachers know the standards? Are they, are they teaching the standards? Um, and then they talked about um, lax rigor. They've talked in lax instructional rigor. They talked about fidelity to the district initiatives. They talked about consistency to our instructional framework. And they also talked about accountability. So those were some of the things that came up in terms of the discussion. Um, what do we want our data to be? We want our data to be, we want the growth, we want the mastery, we want to, our students to be proficient, we want them to be meeting those state targets, both the long-term targets year to year, as well as the incremental targets. And then finally, the last question, how are we going to close the gap? Um, some of the answers that, that teachers shared were um, to increase use of engaging activities to promote rigor in all classrooms, teach to mastery, um, support teachers to know the grade level standards and to provide engaging high quality professional learning for our teachers and to use data to drive the instruction. Um, we as a district, our focus has been back to the basics. This has been something that we have implemented since I think the Leadership Academy, it's, it's, it's our theme, it's, it's our focus, it's, it's our beacon, it's our guiding point. And we are focused on increasing the instructional rigor. Instructional rigor doesn't mean difficult. It means thinking. It's raising the level of thinking for our students. 
um, it, it, we're the data teams. We're going back to our basics with our data teams, which give our, gives our teachers the opportunity to look at data, to discuss data, and then out of that to discuss then the best practices that they're using in terms of the sex successes that they're having in the classroom. Uh, and the data teams really allow um, the professional learning to be customized by school based on their needs. So what a need might be at Potomac may not be the same need, need at Orchard View, uh, for example. Co-teaching. Co-teaching has also been emphasized and we provided professional learning to our administrators and our better trainer, trainer from our administrators to our teachers in terms of uh, embracing co-teaching and having it more embedded uh, throughout the district in our classrooms and, and having the teachers collaboratively working together with our students. And then formative assessments. The format, we're, tonight we looked at the summative assessment. It's a, it's a one and done. But the formative assessments are where the rubber meets the road. It allows us to provide a short, simple assessment, see where the students are at. Then we use that information to change our instructional practices, to drive our instruction to do differently. And so we're able to do these little short incremental of teach, teach, test, teach, teach, test, so that we can make changes as we go. And it allows us to see what our students know, what they're able to do and where we need to make adjustments. Um, one thing that we have provided, we have provided um, instructional playbooks this year. We have the instructional playbooks uh, for um, instructional rigor, for co-teaching, for data teams. We have math for both elementary and secondary, and we have one for literacy. We have embedded um, videos in the, the playbooks. They have, we have thought outside the box in terms of professional learning. So these playbooks are professional learning in terms of being able for our teachers to reference and refer back to and, and watch videos to help guide them with their instructional practices. Um, one thing that we have talked about or that we, when we've looked at the data and we've been working with different groups, we have to focus on what we can control versus what we can't control when we do this and when we have our conversations. And things that we can control, we can control and that data analysis and our response to the data. How are we going to respond to the data that we looked at tonight? What are we going to do differently? Um, we're going supporting teachers in their professional learning, increase in rigorous instruction, and being intentional and purposeful in planning and preparation. What we cannot control, the mobility rate of our students and staff, the number of permanent substitutes that we have in the district and the lack of higher education students, the lack of higher education students going into the education profession. We used to have so many um, students, pedagogy students needing placement for, for student teaching and it has dwindled. So it is, and it's not only a shortage for us in Berkeley County, it is a nationwide shortage in students going on to higher ed and, and majoring in education. Um, the final thing is, and uh, I'm running from my old PowerPoint, so this was changed from this, this morning. Uh, we we re modified this a little bit. Um, assessment is the foundation for good instruction, but also assessment drives instruction. It's so that we do differently, because if we keep doing what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always thought. So we need to be focused on <coughs> using our data to make our data actionable and to do differently. And so that's just a very brief overview. We totally looked at it tonight from the perspective of proficiency. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> And that's part of our accountability system, you know, each each district that's part of our scorecard and 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 so we are accountable for, for that chronic absenteeism. Um, Mr. Van Meter and the department does an outstanding job in terms of, of the work that he does in, in encouraging attendance. Questions? 
I'm still thinking. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you say, uh, I'm going to ask you earlier, but did you say that all students took the SAT school day test or just, just the ones that chose to take it? No, for us in, in West Virginia, it is the SAT school day is our summative assessment. So all grade 11 students took the summative assessment. Now, I have to differentiate between the all data and the full academic year data, because when we look at our, our scorecards and, and when you're looking at, at the data on the scorecards, that reflects the students that were present greater than or equal to 135 days. All students took the data. But for example, if a student moved in close to time for taking the SAT school day, they were required to take it, but they had not been with us a full academic year. So their data would not be included in the accountability. Um, and when I look at the numbers for <clears throat> 2021 and 2022, I did see that what I tried to do was see out of our third graders to try to have to be fourth grade numbers was there any, any change so you were trying to line up the bar graph yeah. from third yeah. grade to fourth grade yeah. and so, fourth grade that yeah yeah so it looks like we are improving um except for math um well, it's, it's abysmal um so yeah. um do you think some of that is caused by the lack of certified math teachers that does that does impact um the, the scores to a certain extent However, I know we have um, many programs in place uh, that Mrs. Lasky has um, lots of professional learning for those non-certified math teachers. But of course, you know, it, it does present itself as, as part of a, of, of, a, of a larger problem for us, but we are working towards providing, you know, supports for those teachers that are non-certified in math. So another question, so we just got the data tonight. You look at individual schools where there are certain schools where their math scores were significantly higher than others. So I'm asking because, say, for instance, if a math teacher at um, Valley View that has just a creative way to really engage the students and really have them learning about math, think outside the box, and things like that, that other teachers may not be using, but they may be effective at other school using. Certain teachers even use music. Teach math. So I didn't know if, you, if there was any school that maybe it was maybe doing a little bit better. I, I think the the school data is there, and, and you'll be able to to see that. And and there are some schools that are are performing um, slightly better than than some others. Um, but for the most part, they are fairly even uh, across the board. They're you know within a certain range in terms of, of that. But in terms of what you're suggesting, you know, we do spotlight those teachers that are having success and, and give them an opportunity to share with our new teachers and, and provide um, suggestions, especially within their own buildings, especially as well. Yeah, I think it would be good for not only me, but even some of the old teachers that are entrenched in their ways and <laughs> that they may find that there are a way to join it. It's not going to the right answer, but the students may not. I have questions. <laughs> um, on slide number six, you have number of enrollments versus test takers. Yes. And the third grade, I mean, it starts out, you know, if there's a difference between what's enrolled versus the test takers for ELA and math. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like, um, that one is a little high, but then you fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. There, there seems to be a trend where it starts to increase a lack of test takers. Yes, I, once enrolled. So, is there what is why is there such a, a disparity between let's say eighth grade versus let's say fourth grade or fifth grade that has I mean the numbers are are quite astounding the differences i mean i think it goes back somewhat to what jackie was saying the in terms of the, the the attendance issue and you know sometimes what will happen is a student possibly will get sick during testing 
and then they'll be out and they won't come back in and do makeup. So you might even notice a difference where the, you know, sometimes the MAC may be slightly uh, lower than the ELA or the ELA slightly larger just because students may not have completed the, the full battery of assessments at, at that time. Um, there's also the, the mobility rate, you know, in terms of students that are tra transferring in and out of the, the district um, during testing. I'm just, it, it, the, the numbers are, I mean, it's more than twice the amount from fourth grade to eighth grade. To eighth grade, so, yes. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. Yes. I, I'd almost expect it to like fluctuate a little bit between the grades, but not be that drastic. But the other, the other thing too sometimes is that our, our homebound students, you know, as they increase, we might have more homebound students okay. at, at the upper grades. And sometimes it's difficult to get them to come into school to test. They are required to test. Um, and then we also offer to, to go into the home and, and test as well. But sometimes it's just a matter of um, a, a refusal to test. Okay. Um, I have another one, but I think uh, Dana asked it and I find a good answer. So. I want to make more. You know where to find me. Oh, okay. You did say in, in your presentation that um, during the leadership training, mm -hmm. um, back to basics was pushed. Yes. Uh, was there ever um, the desire for the administrators, the leadership of that? training to take that back to schools? That was the intent. Everything that we do at the Leadership Academy, the intent was that they took it back to, to the building. So we we did we did training on data teams. Dr. Pont did a fabulous uh, training on data teams. Uh, uh, Kelly House and her team uh, from special education did a wonderful job with co-teaching. And then, um, and rigor, she did the co-teaching of rigor. And then also then some of us from the, the um, teaching and learning for new teachers and for the permanent subs, we did that at the beginning of school for, for that population as well. Okay. But the intent that all of that that we did was done with our leadership. And that, that entailed not only our principals, our assistant principals, but our aspiring principals, which are still teachers in the classroom. Sure. So they heard that firsthand. But the intent was is for our administrators to take the information back to their buildings. Yes, Ms. Murphy. Uh, your uh, full, academic year. full academic year. Yes. I'm a very hard And going back to what Mr. Pamela was asking about science things, mm -hmm. um, the number of test takers, mm -hmm. the, are these the numbers that are the FAY or the FAY? That's all. On that slide, that's all. So when you're looking, when you're looking at that, those were all students in Berkeley County Schools who participated in the assessment. So you saw the, the enrollment for that grade level. At that point in time, you saw then that, that number there under ELA was all students that participated. And for math, it was all students. And so, so that's not FAY. That is that is just all. In, in our training, uh, this past couple of weeks, there were math kids who started to do some of these programs. And they were talking about <clears throat> an idea of how the school did days after the test. In the spring, and you have to wait for the fall to get the end of the project. That is correct. I appreciate it that when that slide six, if you would put the number not half, okay, but uh, it just passed along to us the FAY students who actually counted when they scored the green and the other scores. Because that number is a lot of people who have a ability rate kids subtracted or have your IMCP kids. I don't know what other reasons they filter out, but, but the FAY can actually drops the number it of counted for those part rates. And, and I will be honest with you, Mr. Murphy, in, in terms of looking at the data and, and, and comparing it. It might have dropped maybe by one percentage point. Some states, 